Hey everyone, welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Today will be a video within our end title capnography series. Specifically today we're going to be talking about cardiac arrest and end title capnography. Uh, chest compression adequacy, using it for, to prognosticate, using it to detect return of spontaneous circulation and much more. So stick around. Uh, this is one, if you're new to this channel, this is one of a number of videos we're coming out. Uh, in a series on end title capnography. If you go to our Whiteboard Medicine homepage, uh, you can go to playlists, and within either the pulmonology playlist or the critical care playlist, you can see we got a couple posted already. There's going to be a couple more. So we'll link this in this video's description as well, uh, but definitely check those out. We kind of got a whole series. This is the introduction one, so this will be the most helpful uh, for those people starting to understand this topic who maybe need a little more background. And then we've also covered uh, entitled capnography in obstruction. As a last shout out, we do have a Patreon page. We upload all the video outlines and notes, as well as weekly practice questions um, that can all be accessed on that Patreon page link in the video description. So definitely check that out if you're interested. We'd love for you to join the Whiteboard Medicine Patreon community. No further ado, quick 30 second break for the introduction. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's gonna be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving All right, on. thanks for sticking around. End title capnography and cardiac arrest. So for those of you less familiar, end title capnography is the detection of carbon dioxide being expired or exhaled from an individual. This here is the normal end title capnography waveform. We've talked about this in a previous video, so definitely check that out because we're not going to deep dive on it today. But it involves uh, expiration with four uh, different phases, one, two, three, and then zero, so zero, one, two, three, that all involve different parts of the anatomic uh, respiratory space from the trachea to the bronchi to the alveoli. Uh, and then it gives us an end tidal CO2, which is kind of the peak here. And that's what it kicks out on the monitor. So on the monitor, you'll see this waveform, but you'll also on the side have an end tidal CO2 that's kind of kicking out. It'll say 40 millimeters of mercury. And what it's detecting is this peak here, the top right corner. So this can be helpful in a lot of different clinical situations. One of the big ones um, is cardiac arrest. In fact, ILCOR uh, suggests that you do use end tidal capnography. ILCOR is the, oh boy, international liaison something something of critical care something something. Gosh, we should totally know what that stands for. Someone let us know in the video description. Um, but it's one of the huge international organizations on kind of resuscitation and critical illness. And the reason that it's suggested that you use it um, is that it gives you a lot of information during cardiac arrest. It can tell you about chest compression adequacy. Are you doing adequate chest compressions to perfuse the patient's body and brain best you can? What is the prognosis? Are they likely to get return of spontaneous circulation or not? And then it also can give you insight into if the patient has sustained return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC, aka their heart has restarted again. And the reason is because if you have a patient who is in cardiac arrest, their heart has stopped, they're intubated, and you have end tidal capnography hooked up to their endotracheal tube. The things that are contributing to that end tidal capnography is really going to be the heart's ability to deliver blood to the lungs right? Because we're going to draw a heart quick. There's a heart, not the best heart. Let's see, two lungs, one, two, trachea, bronchi, and there's blood vessels, right? So let's say you have an endotracheal tube here, and this endotracheal tube is detecting the CO2. To get the CO2 into the trachea, the, that the CO2 in the blood has to be pumped to the lungs, right? That CO2 in the blood then has to go to the alveoli, and get into the alveolar space that then gets ventilated up into the bronchi trachea, and then you detect the end tidal CO2. So one of the big things in cardiac arrest is how good are your chest compressions? How good are you pumping the blood from the heart that is filled with CO2 to the lungs? And that's why it can give you a lot of different information 
on chest compression adequacy, prognosis, return of sponta spontaneous circulation, and we'll get into more of that. But it's really the perfusion component, the fact that for CO2 to be expired, exhaled from the lungs, those lungs have to have uh, CO2 delivery, they have to have perfusion, and that delivery of CO2 is based on the cardiac output, which in cardiac arrest, when your heart has stopped, is primarily associated with chest compression adequacy until your heart restarts again, right? All these things are interconnected. So number one, chest compression adequacy. Well, what they have found is that end tidal capnography can be a reflection on lung perfusion, as we've talked about. And when a patient is in cardiac arrest, that lung perfusion, how much blood is flowing to that lungs, is based on how good your chest compressions are, right? Because the heart isn't beating on its own. The heart is stopped. It's in cardiac arrest. So what we are literally doing is, uh, we're not going to be able to probably do a good drawing of this. This is a vertebral column. Um, this here is a sternum, right? The heart sits between the vertebral column and the sternum. And what you're literally doing is you're pushing the sternum down it is then compressing the heart between the vertebral column and the sternum, and then you're releasing the sternum to then relax the heart. So when you press the sternum into the heart, it pumps the blood out. When you release it, the blood then refills passively. You're literally push compressing the heart between the sternum and the vertebral column. So how well you are doing that is going to determine how much blood is flowing to the lungs, which is then going to be reflected in your end tidal carbon dioxide, because that carbon dioxide needs to flow to the lungs to then get exhaled. Quick uh, couple things on chest compressions. You know, the suggestion is about two inches of compression depth. So you want to push the sternum down about two inches, okay? You then want full recoil. This is a big one. You want to totally let the sternum come all the way back up and recoil because that's when the heart's going to fill with blood. If you kind of keep a little pressure there and keep the heart compressed, it won't fill with blood as much before you then compress again. 100 to 120 times per minute. Some people talk about different songs like Who Let the Dogs Out or uh, other ones that you can look up. We won't sing them here. Um, and then you want your hands positioned over the inferior aspect of the sternum. Okay? That's where you want to be doing your chest compressions over the sternum or the breastbone. Now, the reason we pointed this out is some of you watching this video, may not know this information, this may be helpful, which is amazing. Chest compressions save lives. Bystander CPR saves lives. Those of you who are familiar with this, um, the next level understanding here is these are all recommendations, but everyone's heart sits in a slightly different spot, a slightly different position. If you've done bedside ultrasound or bedside echocardiogram, you'll know that sometimes you got to do kind of weird locations to get adequate views of the heart. Someone has COPD, their heart might be shifted. Someone has bad heart disease, their heart might be shifted. So the, these recommendations are just suggestions because we can't look through someone's chest without an ultrasound or something else and see where their heart is to know where we should place our hands. There's lots of discussion on TEE, transesophageal echocardiography, as a guide to where to place your hands for chest compressions because what you could be doing is even if you're positioned in the recommended spot, if that patient's heart's in a slightly different location or axis, you could be compressing areas that are going to be obstructing the blood flow out of the heart. That's why it's important to look at the end title because an end title, carbon dioxide of greater than 15 millimeters of mercury is associated with adequate chest compressions. Obviously, the higher the end title, the better, right? So, more than 15 is associated with adequate chest compressions, but you get it more than 20, that's better. More than 25, that's even better. So something that you should do is if your end tidal is low, if it's less than 15 millimeters of mercury, or if your end tidal, let's say it was 25 millimeters of mercury, and then all of a sudden it starts dropping and it drops down to, you know, even if it dropped from 25 to 15 millimeters of mercury, that suggests that you need to rethink how you're doing your chest compressions. Right? Maybe the person doing chest compressions is tired and you should switch compressors. Maybe you need to reposition. Maybe that person's heart is in a slightly different position. Maybe you need to go more inferior on the body or maybe you need to go more lateral. And this, you could trial this, right? You could move slightly inferior. Watch the end title. If the end title goes from 12 to 20 when you move positions, gosh, that's probably the right thing. If the end title goes from 12 to 10 and drops, well, that position is worse than the other one, so go back to the other one and figure something else out, right? So you could use the end title as real-time feedback when you're repositioning. The other thing to keep in mind, which we're going to talk more about below, is at some point, 
when a patient's heart has been stopped for prolonged periods of time, the end tidal will just slowly drop. And that just implies that there's a poor prognosis, that their heart, they've been in cardiac arrest too long. Um, so if you're, in, you know, an hour, goodness golly, if you do it that long, an hour into doing CPR, their end tidal will eventually drop. And you can switch compressors, reposition, you can do everything perfectly, and that end tidal will still be low, which we'll talk more about below. But the just compression adequacy is huge, and it's nice that you can have this real-time feedback. Right? You can reposition, you could do a deeper compression, you could do more recoil, you can move your hands, and just watch that end title. Anything that leads to the end title increasing suggests you're doing the right thing. Keep doing it or do more of it. Anything that leads to the end title decreasing suggests you're doing the wrong thing. Go back to what you're doing before and then rethink it over. So chest compression adequacy is huge. Another thing is prognosis. So prognosis is... How likely are you to get the patient's heart restarted, get return of spontaneous circulation, get ROSC? And what they found in studies, and this is, you know, just from studies, medical education standpoint, these are not clinical recommendations, um, is that as long as you have an endotracheal tube in place and you're doing adequate chest compressions, right? This is a big one. The chest compressions have to be good. An end tidal CO2 that is less than 10 millimeters of mercury at 20 minutes is correlated with a very low chance that you're gonna to get to return of spontaneous circulation on the patient, that you're gonna get their heart restarted. So this end title of less than 10 at 20 minutes into CPR with adequate chest compressions and an endotracheal tube in place suggests a very low chance of ROSC. What you do with that information is obviously up to you, just medical education here, not clinical recommendations, but poor prognosis associated with an unlikely um, return of spontaneous circulation. Last but not least, return of spontaneous circulation. So as we mentioned with doing chest compression, this is real-time feedback, right? ACLS and even BLS, right? Advanced cardiac life support and basic life support. Um, when you're doing CPR, you have pulse checks, right? These pulse checks are every so often, and you're going to do CPR until a pulse check. And then you check the pulse. If the pulse is back, you got ROSC. If it's not, you continue your CPR or whatever you're doing to try to resuscitate that individual. But end tidal CO2 gives you some real-time feedback, right? Maybe this is you doing chest compressions here, right? This is a patient in cardiac arrest and you're doing chest compressions. Their end tidal CO2 is 18. As we mentioned, an end tidal greater than 15 millimeters of mercury uh, suggests adequate chest compression, so you're doing well there, right? This is every time that you give them a breath through their endotracheal tube with the bag, so you bag them, bag them, bag them, and then you're still doing CPR, but all of a sudden you get this increase in end tidal CO2. You go from 18 to 35. You're still doing CPR here, and it maintains 35, 35. You bag them, you bag them, you bag them. That suggests actually ROSC, a return on spontaneous circulation. An abrupt increase in end tidal CO2 of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury suggests return on spontaneous circulation. Why does that make sense? Well, here you're doing chest compressions. Here their lung perfusion is totally based on how good you're doing chest compressions. All of a sudden the end tidal jumps up by more than 10. Something's changed. They're still doing the same chest compressions you were doing before. And they suggest their heart has restarted beating because their heart is always going to pump blood better than you. Well, I shouldn't say that, but almost always is going to pump blood better than you are able to pump it with chest compressions. So this suggests that the lungs all of a sudden got a huge increase in perfusion, right? A huge increase in blood flow with CO2 because their heart has restarted beating. And that kind of greater than 10 milliliters of mercury is what people quote as kind of that Goldilocks to suggest return on spontaneous circulation. This is not to say you should stop CPR necessarily, right? You should still follow ACLS and everyone does this a little bit different, but it does give you some insight into saying that, well, oh, I think we maybe got them back on that next pulse check. Hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully this was educational. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Um, let us know um, what other things you want us to follow, check, or sorry, want us to cover, check out those other end title capnography uh, videos as you see fit. And in any case, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.